Welcome to Healthcare by the Numbers, a podcast that uncovers what's driving healthcare transformation. Join us each episode as Caravan Health leaders interview the brightest minds inspiring healthcare innovation and discuss the numbers which have shaped their thinking. Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, Greg Paris. I'm the Vice President of Client Success at Caravan Health, and I want to welcome you to Healthcare by the Numbers. This is a a podcast that explores numbers driving change throughout our healthcare industry. You can learn more about Caravan Health, this podcast, and to check out episodes of the show by going to caravanhealth.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter for future episodes, and you can also visit our program page on Healthcare Now Radio. You can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook under our username, at Caravan Health. I'm really, really excited today to get to talk to not only a couple of colleagues who know the healthcare industry, but um, folks that I, I would call friends. Uh, it, it's funny that you, yeah, the CEOs sort of have this kind of brotherhood or sisterhood in some cases, where once you're talking to somebody and they find out you were a CEO in your prior life, there's this little bond that goes um, together and you, you become instant friends. And, and I think it's just because they learn that you've been beat up and kicked around too. And there's a little bit of that uh, that, that pain that, that bonds us together. I spent 20 years as a hospital CEO, uh, just so you know my background today as well. Um, but thrilled to be joined today with Amy McDaniel. Um, Amy's the Chief Executive Officer at Iowa Specialty Hospitals and Clinics in Belmont, Iowa. Uh, Steve Barnett also joined us today. He's the President and CEO at McKinsey Health System in Sandusky, Michigan. As I said, you know, two experts who uh, really know what's going on in the healthcare industry. I got to know uh, both of them through the work that we do at Caravan Health, where we manage population health services. Uh, these were a couple of very early adopters in our, our program, and so really have some experiences that I think our listeners will enjoy um, relating to and, and, and hearing about today. Um, both of them joined under the, um, or at least came into with, through the AIM, AIM model, uh, which is the ACO investment model. Um, which was a program that CMS put out in 2016 uh, to help rural organizations make that jump into value-based care. And I, I bet that Amy and Steve very much like I did, and we talked for a long, long time in our organization when I was a CEO, that someday we're going to get paid differently. Um, and nobody ever denied that you get paid on value versus volume. The question was, how do you get there? How do you get good at it? Um, and so this was CMS's attempt at putting some grant monies or loans out there Uh, to help organizations um, learn how to put the training wheels on for value-based care. Um, And from Caravan Health standpoint, just a quick introduction there, and and I'll do a real fast little um, bio on Amy and Steve, and we'll get going. Um, But Caravan Health, we got our start um, really in rural value-based payment. I mean, really going to be interested in hearing Steve's comments today, because Steve was one of those very first ones sitting around the table when they said, we got to get good at this. Um, How do we do it when we're small? And it's really our niche that we put a lot of small organizations together and form very large ACOs and, and have had some really good success. Uh, during that three-year AIM model period, um, there were more than 41 ACOs that CMS uh, participated with. We had more than half of those at about 60% of the savings, um, which represented about $382 million of savings for CMS. So value-based care in the rural setting can be effective. And again, really excited to get to listen to these guys today talk about their history and lessons learned through that. Um, I'll do a real fast little bio and then Amy and Steve will will just do a a hello um, and I'll share some numbers and then I've got some questions and this is just a free form uh, kind of a conversation together today. Um, But really looking forward to this. Um, Amy, um, as I said, the CEO at Iowa Specialty um, Hospital uh, has been in that role since June of 2013. Uh, They've earned a five-star CMS designation in 2017. Um, also this year, the National Rural Health Association named their hospital a, tw- a top 20 critical access hospital for overall patient satisfaction. Amy and I have done a lot of work together with um, Studer Group, and um, I really respect the work that they've done there. Um, equal respect for Steve and the work that he's done. Um, has been the president and CEO at McKinsey Health System in Michigan since May of 2008. Um, so um, a, a, a longtime Michiganer, he was a CEO at Harbor um, Beach Community Hospital. Um, before that, uh, 36 years of healthcare experience, and I can tell you one of the most respected CEOs, not just in Michigan, um, but also across the country. Um, Amy, welcome. Thank you for having me today, Greg. 
Happy to. And Steve, thanks for joining us as well. Nice to be here. Thanks, guys. So before we listen to these guys, this is a, a podcast. It's, it's by the numbers. And so we always look at some numbers that are out there, uh, in this case, from a rural um, organization perspective. And we're going we're to talk about a couple of things today. I want to really focus on, on culture and leadership. And, and we'll probably talk a little bit about change um, around a couple of areas. First of all, it's just tough. It's one of the hardest jobs um, that's out there. I was talking to a CEO friend of mine uh, last week, and um, he's getting ready to retire. He said the last year kind of sped him up a little bit. He says it's been the toughest year to be a CEO in a rural hospital, which is already an incredibly difficult job. Um, but we'll get to uh, listen to a little bit of that, just um, how tough it is in, in a hospital and some things these guys have learned around culture and change and leadership. Um, and we might dip our toes into COVID just a little bit, too, because you can't talk today without talking about COVID. It seems. So uh, we'll find a place for that, too. Um, so just some numbers. So we kind of level set. And, and I'll ask Amy and Steve to give me a reaction about that and, and kind of a jumping off point before I ask them a couple of questions. Um, but recent report for Center for Healthcare Quality found that uh, more than 500 rural hospitals are at risk of closure. Let's start off with some really good news, right? Um, and this was before COVID-19, um, 40 hospitals in Iowa. We've all heard those numbers for a long, long time, just about how thin the margins are, the, the days of cash are small, um, and just how difficult it is to operate a hospital, as we said before. Um, Michigan, um, there's your COVID numbers. Uh, they've been up and down. They were recently spotlighted national news as in one of those places that's had to go back to some shutdowns, but the seven-day average seems to be dropping. Um, the number of vaccines, um, which I'm sure Steve's hospital participated in, and that piece of it um, seems to be having some effects. So um, seven-day average for new cases down to uh, by about 12.5% by the numbers that we look at, and 3.7 Michigan million Michigan residents have that um, COVID, COVID vaccine. Um, we've we all know that um, in rural areas that uh, local hospital is a, a critical source of, of care. Um, we've heard the numbers one in five um, rely solely on their local hospitals. Uh, my experience would tell me it's probably a, a lot higher than that. Um, and um, put those two things together and the impact that we've seen in the last year between COVID and um, hospital operations just in general, um, projections in 2021 that revenues could drop by some $122 billion. So thus the challenges that we've got from um, operations in a normal day. And this certainly hasn't been a normal year over the last year. So with all those good news numbers that I laid out at you, Amy, what, what jumps out at you? And, and again, welcome. Yeah, I would say the first um, fact that you shared jumped out at me the most, that there's 500 facilities at risk for closure across um, the nation and 40 of those being in Iowa with only 82 critical access hospitals in Iowa. That's, you know, just right around 50% of, of us that are at risk of closing at any point in time. And, you know, that being a vital piece of the communities that we serve and then knowing that if you have to travel for that care, um, those minutes matter. So there's, it could be catastrophic across the health care system um, not just to us, but to the larger facilities as well, that most of them are working at capacity or over capacity right now. Um, so making sure that we are able to care for our patients in a timely manner is critical. Um, with those margins being slim, like you mentioned, that work that we do is more important every single day. So one of the things that I feel like we have been able to accomplish with partnering with the ACO is really focusing on our patients and focusing on preventative care. Um, and looking at different strategies to try to reduce our risk at being one of those hospitals that may have to close in the future. So that one really jumped out at me. I feel like we've talked about it, obviously, as CEOs, we've talked about it a lot, but I think it's important for the nation to understand what that truly means for the impact to the care that they would receive anywhere in the United States, right? Not just in Iowa. Yeah, good, good points. I see Steve nodding his head as well, but Steve, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Same sort of question. What's your reaction to those numbers and, and the ones that you know that you deal with every single day? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I would echo what Amy is saying. I, the first one certainly got my attention. I know that uh, you can do look at the statistics across the U S and every state probably has something uh, to hold out in terms of, uh, hospitals that are at risk, and they're usually small rural hospitals. And then 
the middle bullet, you know, one in five Americans, I agree, Greg, it's probably a little bit higher than one in five, uh, are accessing care in small rural hospitals across the country. And then the margin that is mentioned in the last book, uh, bulletin of being a negative 2.8, you know, and being the, the worst margin in 30 years is concerning. You put all those three together, and I think it, it, it speaks volumes to, you know, decades of functioning in a fee-for-service environment um, that's only in the last 11 years um, switched through the Affordable Care Act in 2010 being passed to this value um, health you know, improvement model that, w- that we're moving into now. And I, I usually frame it as we, we went from sickness and volume. So the only way we got paid is to do stuff to you, to this wellness value model, which is really what the, the track has been on. And that's what the ACO has been all about. The question was, how do we adopt that in rural environments and be successful? And I would argue that some of these hospitals that are on that short list of financial um, uh, risk, you know, have probably not jumped in yet and fully adopted or, or started moving and transitioning how they deliver care. That's a really interesting point. You know, and maybe it leads to this question of, of what is it? It seems like any time you go through some change, there's some early adopters. There's a big bolus of folks in the middle of the bell curve that will come along once everybody else does or when money pushes them that way or, or whatever the, the impetus is. And then there's always some folks at the tail end of the curve, too, that won't, won't go until it's too late. But speak to me from a leadership standpoint. And Steve, I'm going to start with you. Just talk to me a little bit about your leadership style and specifically what's your organization done to be successful in terms of being on the front end of that, not getting caught up in the day-to-day whirlwind that seems like you're just constantly putting out fires but you've had a chance to proactively strategize where do we want to go. You wouldn't be doing value-based care if that wasn't the case. I run into so many CEOs that say, I'd like to do it, but I'm recruiting physicians. I'm short of nurses. I've, I, I've got this project going on or that project going on. And, and the strategy seems to be the last piece. What is it you do differently? What can you impart from a leadership perspective that might be helpful to a listener today? Well, we, we made a conscious effort <clears throat> right before 2010, I mean, if anybody listened to the debates that were occurring over uh, reforming healthcare, that wasn't the first hurrah, as as all three of us know, (laughs) this debate has occurred uh, a number of times over many decades. And the whole point is that you you keep your eye on this consumption of of, um, financial resources in the country, and it's unsustainable as it continues to rise. So, having listened intently to the the Clinton era debate, 93, 94, about capitation and managed care and and how we control cost in this country, really played a, a role in our decision here at McKenzie uh, to start working on how we transition the delivery of care given the debate that was going on in 09 and and 10, because I think we're going to make it this time. We're going to actually reform how healthcare is organized and, and really change the focal point. You know, it's again, no longer going to be about that fee for service model. That's volume driven. It's going to be, how do we improve the health of a population that we're serving in our community And how, when we do things, are we adding value um, or really contributing to that improvement in health? And I think we began that transition even before the precursor to the AIM model, the advanced payments uh, model, came along. uh, That was the precursor to meeting Lynn and and that small band of of us that (laughs) started back in 2013 and led to where we are today. So I don't know if that answers your question directly, but, you know, I I think it was driven by a number of things and a lot of history. I've I've always had this vision of a a really dark room with a table and a lot of smoke in the air, and you guys sitting around a single light over the table planning out the what, what has become caravan and, and your path. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that's that's what I'll always carry with me. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just interested. It's just the leadership dynamics of this thing are so evident. You guys are both 
I'm going to be, I know you're going to be really humble in, in your response to this one, but you know, how, how does leadership play in it for you? What tips would you give to somebody so that they can truly stay focused? And as Steve said, act on where you think the industry's going. And as equally, I heard Steve say, don't be reactive and jump at everything that shows up. How do you, how do you stay out of the whirlwind and pick and choose the strategy and, and how does leadership play into that for you? Yeah, I mean, I feel like you, Greg, you mentioned that we follow the student principles and have for many, many years. So I, I think from a culture standpoint, our facility is set up to continue to focus on the patient, put that service first. So that, like um, Steve said, that is kind of the piece of making sure that we can provide those services to our patients, do what's best for our patients always, helps lead those discussions and helps lead that direction. But I think in all honesty, as a rural facility with all of those negatives that we talked about at the beginning, fear is somewhat that push that we need to make us take that leap. So fear of being left behind, fear of not being able to make that transition to value-based care and making sure that you're on the front end of that, that you have time to learn and grow and um, incorporate those processes in place before it's too late and it has moved past you. So I know timing is a huge piece of it. So Steve was on the very, very early side of that. We joined the ACO in 2015 um, and were able to take part of some of those AIM funds and, and kind of dabble and learn without having a lot of risk. So I think making sure you balance kind of what's best for our patient base, but also taking that leap before, like Steve said, before it's too late, but not jumping on everything. The time definitely is now. And I think Caravan has been an incredible partner for us in helping us focus on what's important um, to make the most impact to our patients. So I think that's kind of from our side of the equation, what we, what we focused on and how we made our decisions. You know, sometimes it, it strikes me that sometimes the hesitancy comes from, Maybe it's pride or maybe it's something else, but I, I see rural hospitals that, that almost are benign to reaching out to somebody for some help who can really, truly help them. I, um, I, not long ago, I was talking to Terry Hill. I think both of you know Terry from the, the Rural Health Center, a really well-known, respected um, guy across the country when it comes to rural health. And Terry said something that stuck with me. He said, we have in rural health care in particular, we have a tendency to over-rely on people within our buildings and we have a tendency to under rely on people outside who could it really help us. And it stuck with me because I can remember again, you, know, you get 400 emails a day and people are telling you the ROI this, ROI that, and you almost get blind to messages that really could be helpful to you. But um, for Amy, I mean, it is both student group work for you, Caravan um, work on the value-based side. Sometimes you've got to have um, somebody with some expertise that can help you take that jump start, don't you? Yes, I think, Greg, that's a perfect point. I think a lot of times in rural facilities, you know, we all wear a lot of hats, right? So we're all, we're all doing multiple positions at any given point in time. So we have a lot of expertise in our buildings, but I think it's important to know that when you're, um, when you're kind of batting outside of your area, right? So like knowing that Caravan has the ability to truly data mine, we would never be able to afford the staff to be able to dig into all of that information and truly pick a path. And I think that's one of the best things that we've been able to achieve is having somebody truly assist us, give us the information, give us that direction and help us focus in on something so we can incorporate a process, actually get it fixed, affect that change and then move on to the next process. Because it is incredibly overwhelming um, as a CEO trying to you know, research different areas, trying to figure out what pieces of data are going to make the most impact to our patients. So I think that's been a huge benefit for us. Yeah. Steve, you, you ever see that too, is maybe your neighbor's not so much in your organization, I'm sure, but that, that underreliance when somebody knocks on your door and says, we can help you, here's ROI, five times what your investment will be. And, and you just sort of get just um, blinded by that message to the point where you miss opportunities that you might really have that could truly help you. Yeah, I, I, Greg, you know this as well as Amy. Um, anybody who's been in this business for any length of time, uh, you get a lot of carpetbaggers that show up at the door, and that can either be via email, phone, or literally at the door, trying to sell you something that's better than any other widget you ever saw. And yeah, I, I think you become guarded. And part of the trick of continuing to go forward is not let that that natural um, instinct to push back get in the way of hearing what they have to offer. And, and, you know, and I think in part, 
knowing whether or not it fits into where you are as an organization right now and where you're trying to go. I, I get frustrated often um, with neighboring facilities who say they want to collaborate, but don't collaborate. <laughs> and I think we find that across the country, I don't think it's unique to hear uh, that people in rural America get stuck in that Friday night light thing. And they really put a, 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 a fence around their organization. And that limits um, who you're going to listen to on the outside. And if you feel like you've always got to reinvent or invent the wheel or fire yourself, uh, even though it's burning next door, uh, it, it really pushes a lot of opportunity away and you become resistant to change. Yeah, I, I, I knew there'd be some Studer references with Amy on today, but I, I'm reminded of something Quint said that sometimes even world-class athletes have coaches. And sometimes you've got to have somebody that can help jumpstart you and, and, and get you there. So um, well, well said. I, mean, I, want, I, want to, I want to frame this for folks that are listening to us today who might be saying, well, why in the world are we talking about AIM? And, and it, yeah, it's how we came together. And there's a little bit of insight today to help those who may not be fully involved in value-based care um, to realize that the time is now. Um, but, but I also think that there's an opportunity just to learn because there are opportunities today and people might be trying to make that decision today that you guys made um, five or six years ago to, to jump in to value-based care and population health. So I want to take you back to um, that aim because um, there are those opportunities today. And think about when you guys first got involved and um, your journey all the way to today. If we just put a big old umbrella over that, what might be a couple of things that you wish you would have known before you got started and that you've learned along the way that might be a, a helpful jumping off point for us as we continue our conversation? Steve, I'm going to go back to you for a response on that. Well, I, I almost have to go back to before AIM uh, because, again, I, I referenced the advanced payment model that was available, and AIM w was re really structured a lot like that. And I think AIM made changes, uh, CMMI made changes uh, that they learned from the advanced payment model, and that is don't limit the gross revenue that would be the, res the aggregate of the participants because that's too small a number if you really need X number of lives to have a chance at being successful. And then that front loading cost or expense of 98% under the advanced payment model uh, really caught the eye of some of those carpet bankers who really have nothing to do with delivering patient care, but they were trying to bring something to the table like claims data analysis and want the 98%. And so what was clear to me is that there is nothing left to operationalize an ACO. And, and so I kept moving away from those. And that's when I uh, was introduced to Lynn and, and the other brave seven or eight souls that were sitting around a dark room smoking cigars uh, <laughs> to create the National Rural Accountable Care Organization. And, and there was a lot of learning very quickly uh, under that model and and Lynn's leadership really led to, okay, I got to move the service side of the organization that's going to feed these communities that are trying to operationalize an ACO over here and keep it separate from the ACO so that you can all, in an a la carte sort of way, pick and choose what you need. And the biggest one, as Amy uh, alluded to, was grappling, you know, grappling with data that's coming back from CMS and how do we interface that, make it work, and then be able to turn that into something that, that we can learn from and, and make changes along the way. So there was a gap between 13 and 15 um, when AIM became clear it was going to be available that we were able to sit around and talk to other CEOs who hadn't joined and wouldn't join in Michigan. And the question that was asked is, what would it, would any of you join an ACO if, if um, there were no, there was no funding? 
and it was universal, except for the two of us that were already in it. Uh, no. And so AIM was the starter that got people going because it reduced their out-of-pocket expense and it got them in the game and then they started learning. In my view, and I've said this before, once you start down this path, there's no turning back. You know, <laughs> No matter what you got to do to afford it, you're going to make it work because it's the right thing to do. Amy, same sort of thing, just, you know, what, what do you wish you would have known before you started, but equally as important, what kind of lessons have you, have you learned along the way that might be helpful to somebody listening today? Yeah, I think, you know, specifically with critical access hospitals, I think it was hard to wrap your mind around the fact that you were going to reduce cost and cost is how you're paid, right? So how do, how do I drive down the cost when really, so mentally shifting from that, you know, patients in the bed to really making sure that we really are trying to keep those patients out of the hospital and how is that going to affect my facility? And I, we had the bonus of actually seeing a shift in our payer mix. And so we've been able to achieve shared savings and actually be more profitable because of our participation in the ACO. So I think, I think that is a huge fear for a lot of CEOs is not truly understanding like how, how am I going to align these two things when it doesn't really make sense initially. Um, that I think there are a lot of lessons learned and strategies like we talked about. Caravan has been great about giving us processes to focus on. So um, like transitional care management. I know, Steve, you talked about, you know, we have a lot of collaborators around us that really don't want to collaborate. So a lot of times patients are the ones that get lost in that shuffle. So that transitional care management was a focus for us early on and something that we continued to have throughout all of our years in the ACO. Um, which is truly the most beneficial for the patient, right? It allows you to capture that patient between systems and make sure that they are uh, meeting medication compliance and that they are recovering like they're supposed to. So there's just so many tactics that I think we've been able to implement that have truly affected our patients. Um, So looking back, if I would have known that I could be part of something bigger and really make that beneficial impact on our patients, I think it would have been an easier decision to jump earlier, right? Because that's what we all are trying to accomplish. Yeah, and I think they're all facing it today, boy. Some really good points there. And I, as we talk to CEOs across the country, there's that hesitancy. That's exactly what you said. Is why would I, why would I reduce my reimbursement so that I can get part of it back? I mean, there's that that kind of misnomer there. I mean, the impact on your organization, Amy, has there been that sort of a fear come realized? Did you lose revenue by being part of this agreement and? Some of it got made up through shared savings or has it it not been that way? It has not been that way. So I think, like I said, the strategies that have been implemented for us have increased our patient volumes. I think when we started in the ACO, our um, assigned patient list was maybe 700 people. So we didn't have clearly enough volume to even consider being part of an ACO unless we joined with others. And now I think we're around 1,500. So we've seen an increase in our patient volumes. We've seen an increase in being able to affect those patients. But then, like I said, we also saw a shift in our payer mix that has led to us being more profitable. So we've seen the opposite. But like I said, it's, it is hard to wrap your mind around when that is how you know the payment structure is in place, um, understanding how that's going to shift and change to support you. Yeah, Steve, I, 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 I didn't give you a heads up that I might ask you this one, but I'm, I'm curious is what would you, what would you do if you were head of CMS to really move this ball forward? I mean, we, we've gone through the AIM program, which was funding to help a few organizations kind of dabble in this, put their training wheels on. We say um, there's a few more that are going to come because Caravan's going to sponsor one chart um, was kind of AIM 2.0 and it got um, postponed probably until next year. So there's a little bit of that um, seed money out there to help people get going. But if you really wanted to to take the vision and, and bring it to fruition that says someday we're really going to get paid this way and you had the ability to make those changes to make that happen, what would you do? I look at how healthcare is financed because you're going to organize how you deliver care as a function of how you're paid and that counterintuitive component that Amy uh, spoke to is exactly what so many CEOs have struggled with when they're getting into um, into this business and trying to move and transition their delivery. I I I think the the problem we've had or the things that I notice 
uh, with some of the advanced models over the last few years, uh, CMS or CMMI, I'm not probably CMMI, you know, they're, they're running around trying to recruit other payers uh, to make some sort of commitment to becoming part of this value added model, you know, and, and, and help you grow your attributed lives by more than just the Medicare population that you may be dealing with. And what we found is that often those payers, and in our case, it would be Blue Cross or Priority Health, which is probably the second largest payer in the state, they were listed as as co-conspirators, if you will, but they didn't even know internally. So that tells me that they're not taking this stuff uh, as seriously as I think CMMI or CMS would like them to. So somehow they've got to wrap their arms around that group a little bit more firmly. And it would be nice if CMS has the power to influence the commercial market with at least the Medicare Advantage population. And I think find a way to force them to at least offer that up as part of the attributed life piece that we're, we're dealing with. Because as you guys know, and um, Caravan has, has really, I think, made it very clear that the larger the number of lives you have, the likelihood rises with your success along that path. And, and if you're really in a capitated model, if that's how financing progresses, then that's the way we're going to dilute the number of outliers that are going to really throw you off and prevent you from being able to benefit from shared savings. So how do you get those lives that you have some influence over to the table? And how do you overcome the reservations that many of our state departments of health and human services that have control over Medicaid lives? How can you influence that so that they're motivated to move a lot quicker than they have been. Yeah, I heard somewhere that somebody say that's very, very true is sort of what you just said that um, organizations will change when they have to follow the money or they have to follow the regulations. Either somebody makes them do it or the money makes them go that direction. They have to follow it. And somewhere along the way, I think that's got to be the change. What what we play in today is very much a, a bonus system where you don't change your reimbursement, but we have the potential to add on to it um, and, and potentially lose to it now if you're going to go to risk. But but I think you're going to have to change something in that world. And and, and the other piece that struck me as you guys were talking about, I heard this from uh, one of our auditors a few years ago that said 80% of the spend by your patients is actually done outside of your local healthcare system. So think about your referrals and the money that gets spent in tertiary when you're thinking about Amy's comments around um we think we're going to lose money and then get part of it back in bonus. It, it's actually waste in the system, which um, we've found is, is something that you can attack and, and really not feel it in your own revenue and actually can grow your revenue. Um, I, I, I think, you know, given the chart got postponed this year from CMS, but, but we're standing up and, and I'm going to, going to run kind of our own rural program. Here's a chance for somebody to, to get those training wheels on. I've said that about three times in this, in this podcast, it, talk about the value of this, um, getting good at this before that day comes when CMS says we're going to change a reimbursement system, as opposed to, well, I'll wait until somebody makes me go there. What, what have you, Steve, what have you, what, what have you, what's been the advantage for you guys of being playing in this space for so long that you're going to have when that day does come? Well, I, for us early on, it was, we've got to get moving on this because it takes time to transition how you're going to deliver care. Part of the messaging internally that helped, I think, change the culture as well as motivate people to move in that direction, we changed our mission statement uh, to reflect the fact that we're going to uh, continue to be innovative and transition how we deliver care so that it it focuses on wellness and and value rather than the sickness and, and volume model that we for decades have been stuck in. Because it takes such a long time, uh, this is like, you know, we're 15 miles from Lake Huron. So the Great Lakes are large bodies of fresh water and 
there are these huge freighters that move up and down delivering iron ore from the UP to wherever. And it's been stated that if they're going to make a turn, they have to project 13 miles ahead (laughs) as they prepare to turn that thing around. And I think it's like that with how we deliver care. The projection on, on getting people to begin to transition and move, particularly as Amy pointed out, when we have this convoluted, we get paid to do stuff, but we were, we're trying to focus on value. You know, it takes time to redesign how you deliver care and reorganize and, and really get everybody uh, moving in that direction. But I think the, the light at that end of the tunnel that I continue to point people at is that it's a capitated finance model where you're getting paid a given fee and and you're supposed to manage that population. And that population is going to be made up of, of all consumers, not just Medicare and Medicaid, but it, it'll probably have the commercial lives embedded in there as well. And so the sooner we're prepared for that and know how to maintain the quality and, and we can help guide uh, the analytics people at CareMan on what reports and what's useful as we process claims data, the better we're going to be. And for anybody that is still thinking about whether or not this is going to be a reality, um, you know, I, I, I think that that train left the station a long time ago. It's time to get on board. Yeah. And Amy, I, I love your comments too, but it, it's, it struck me that I, I don't know that I've ever run into anybody, Steve and Amy, that have denied that value-based payment, value-based care, it is coming. It's always been that question of when and how are they going to do it. But yet, so often people by their actions or their words say, I'll wait until I have to go there. I'm not going until I got to go. Nobody's making me go today. Amy, do you feel like you got an advantage playing in this space for the last five years that you're going to hit the ground running and be best prepared for when that day comes? Absolutely. <clears throat> I would say absolutely. Um, I feel like, like Steve said, the trains left the station. So the sooner that you can jump on board and start to get those processes in place, that it does take a lot of time and energy and effort. We have the um, advantage that our, our physicians are employed, but still finding a physician champion that truly understands it and is passionate about making those changes in their practice is is vital to that. And I, that took some time for us, but even like Steve said, this is, it's going to bleed over into all of the markets and all of the patients that we care for. So being able to work on those processes, implement them. And when we implement something like in our um, EHR, we implement it across our payers. So not just for our Medicare population. So when, when that flip, when they flip that switch, we will be prepared with whatever that patient base looks like to be able to provide that quality of care for those patients and, and be able to do, like Steve said, the data analytics to be able to support what direction we're going. It, it isn't not going to be optional at some point. So I, I understand the hesitancy, but I feel like early on it was, well, maybe it'll switch or maybe it'll go away. I don't see that happening. So I think, yes, we will definitely be prepared. And I think if you're not on board, you should jump soon, very, very soon. Very good. I promise when we started today that there's no way you can get done with a webinar or a podcast without bringing COVID up somewhere along the way. It's just um, very directly or very indirectly, it seems to impact everything we do in our lives um, today. And, and I guess my question for you, and Amy, I'll come back and, and just sort of start with you, is is talk to me just very globally about the lessons that we've talked about over the last 40 minutes. And we've talked about leadership, and we've talked about culture, and we've talked about the ability to manage change. Um, I think I think as I talk to CEOs across the country, we're a lot more alike in terms of the COVID impact than we're different. Um, Almost everybody's had the fear, the planning early. Um, Everybody's had to pull resources and reassign them. They've had to shift some of their work to other um, areas of focus for a short period of time. Um, But it seems to me that it's, it's a lot of it's about leadership in terms of how easy it is to bounce back, how easy it is to deal with COVID in your area, acknowledging that some places got hit harder than others. So my question for you really is, you know, what everything we've talked about today in terms of leadership, the ability to manage change, your culture and your organization, how's it impacted your ability to deal with COVID over the last year and three months? Yeah, I would say 
honestly, a lot of the work that we did within the ACO prepared our team to be able to transition quickly and make those changes rapidly. So one of the things that we had been working on pre-COVID was uh, telehealth and being able, being able to offer that to our patients. So we were able to implement that within like 10 days of de- when we decided to reduce the clinic visits in our area. Um, so being able to still provide services in different alternative ways, I think the ACO has prepared us for that. We had made a lot of transitions during that time. We um, At the Belmont facility, we did keep a lot of inpatients for COVID that we could for as long as we could to try to provide those services locally. So I think when you talk about culture and leadership, you talk about being able to react rapidly. And I think having learned many lessons through our participation with the ACO, that prepared us to maybe navigate a little faster than had we not had some of that experience. So um, we, I feel like, continue to see one to two patients a week that are hospitalized with complications for COVID in our area. So it definitely is not gone, but I feel like we've been able to regain a lot of our surgical volumes. Um, We do still see a decline in our clinic visits. People still are putting off preventative care um, that that impact, but then being able to reach out to them with telehealth and giving them different options, I think has allowed us to kind of balance some of the impact of, of a lot of that. Very interesting, very insightful. Steve, what do you, what do you think about the carryover between the ability to manage change on a daily basis, value-based care implementation and what hit you with COVID? What, what, what helped you from what you learned? I think the, culture that we've been able to develop since 2008 is one that does not fear change and embraces innovation. And probably at the heart of it, they believe the messaging that I've been putting forward that we have to move uh, away from this old model of fee for service. And And anybody who's looking at the logic of it and listening to the politics of it, um, it's not hard to to come to the same conclusion that we've got to redesign what we're doing or we're not going to be able to provide health care. The fact that if you look back at how health care has been organized and paid for in this country, um, many other countries around the world had universal health care coverage uh, predating 1920, you know, and so we are, we've been stuck in a fee for uh, service model that's been commercially driven for just decades when the rest of the world has been moving in, in a whole different direction. And, and we still don't have the benefit of the higher quality at the high cost that we pay. You know, we're ranked, I think, 37th or 38th worldwide. So people have to believe what you're saying. Um, They have to be willing to, I don't want to say follow, because it feels to me as if everybody is engaged. And, And maybe that's what door has been opened, is we've got to solve this problem of how to redesign how we deliver care so that it aligns with this value-based model that we're entering into. And I need everybody to help with that because I don't have those answers. And that stuff kind of feeds on itself. When people start engaging in that conversation and contributing, they get excited about the outcomes and what they're able to accomplish. And they really feel like they're, 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 what, what they're creating is an expression of, of the kind of healthcare that they would like to have organized in the community that, that they live in. And so all of that activity and that energy that has built over time really made adjusting and adapting to COVID remarkably easy because we were able to throw negative pressure rooms up within a week you know, and come up with a redesign on how to move patients around to a different entry based on how they were screened at the door and locked down and, and, and get our vents organized and everybody, you know, PPE available and set up carts and everything moved very briskly. And I think we've just continued to, to be able to do that along the way. And I think that in part is because of the culture that's been created that was really being driven by 
this change that we've got to make um, as a result of what happened uh, in 2010 with the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, really interesting to hear both of you say that while while the pandemic was not easy by any stretch of the imagination, the fact that you had cultures in place that were not scared of change, that were not scared to make the, the appropriate measures and take the right steps at the right time um, helped you be more successful for that. And, and both of these guys are incredibly humble leaders and they wouldn't say it, but I will say it is that culture comes from leadership. It's what you do, it's what you, it's what you say, it's how you back up your actions and how you treat people. So um, as I promised folks today on this podcast, um, two outstanding leaders that um, I'm blessed to get to know, get to work with and, and call my friends. So thank you both for joining us. I'll just open it up for any last thoughts. Amy, I'll um, ask you anything that, that you've got that's rolling around in the head that we, yeah, I wanted to say it and I never found the right place, but give you a chance to make sure that you share it for folks. Yeah, no, just, I think, Greg, thank you. Thanks for allowing me to share my experiences and Caravan has been an incredible partner for us. And I feel like as a critical access hospital without some kind of leadership or guidance, like you said, that expertise outside of your building, sometimes you, you have to reach out for that. That is definitely a standard that we strive for. And Caravan has been that partner for us. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity today to share. Yeah, I, I appreciate your time too. I know how valuable it is. Steve, any final thoughts or comments? Yeah, I, you know, I, it's not that I don't look around um, only to assess the field of, um, I think we've decided that what Caravan is, is an ACO enabler, or that's the group that it's part of. I can't think of any other organization that has really put what has been put together uh, as well, so that it really is serves rural America. And I think this place that we're in and, and moving through uh, allows us to deliver the kind of care and spend the type of time that most providers want to spend with the patient rather than having to meet some sort of rule or regulation that has been tied to fee for service forever. So I think the faster we move through this, and I'm excited about, believe it or not, taking on risk <laughs> going forward because I think we're prepared to do that. And I think we'll do fine. So I encourage everybody to get on board fast. Thanks, Steve. And, and for everybody who joined us today, I want to make sure I say thank you for your time too. We didn't we didn't talk a lot about the opportunities. This wasn't supposed to be a sales speech. So we didn't talk a lot about the opportunity that's out there. But if there is somebody that's trying to develop their population health strategy and wants to know a little bit more about the opportunity that's out there. It's never been a better time. We've got an opportunity today that you can join at no cost and no risk. Um, the two biggest barriers that we hear from Merle, and we've got a chance to double your 340B dollars as part of that. And love to have that conversation about how we do that because I think it's a game changer for some leaders that are out there. So if you're looking for somebody from outside who can help you, um, we've heard them today talk about um, the fact that Caravan can get you there. So um, find me on LinkedIn, um, shoot a response back um, to this podcast, and we'll get you hooked up with some folks who can provide you some information. But I do want to thank everybody who joined us today for their time. Um, if you want to learn more about Amy and Steve and the good work that they're doing in their organizations, they're both out there on LinkedIn, and, and you can find them there. Um, again, appreciate everybody for listening today. Uh, this is Caravan Health. This has been Healthcare by the Numbers. And until next time, take care.